So hello everybody. So a little notice before I get started. Uh, this was this is a 35 minute talk, and unfortunately, due to a bit of a scheduling snafu, it's scheduled for 20 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to go into the break a little bit. I will not be offended if you have to go and get coffee, but all the good stuff's at the end. So <laughs> I've got my own cocktail. I don't have my own cocktail recipe. I wish I wish I did. Um, so my name is Adam Comerford. Uh, I'm a systems engineer and write games. I've been there about a year and a half. Uh, my history is many and varied roles. I've been a network engineer, systems engineer, uh, SRE. Uh, don't put much stock in titles too much. I might li much like to hear what you're actually doing uh, personally. But um, the title of this talk has actually changed. If you're looking at your, uh, if you're looking at your programs, you might notice that, right? Because when I was actually writing, when I wrote the outline, I came up with the sort of concept of the talk, and then I wrote the outline, and it all sort of fell together fine. When I wrote the presentation, I decided it was a really dry, sort of boring title, so I've changed it. So the new title is Write Games Versus the Internet, because it's a little bit more dramatic, right? And the, the original title is still there, right? So uh, Fixing the Internet for Real Time Applications, and in this case, specifically games. So before I tell you all the wonderful stuff we do, uh, I'm going to actually explain who Write Games are and not just assume everyone knows who we are and what we do. Um, so I'm going to do a little quick poll. I promise I won't make do too much. Um, who here plays computer games generally? I was figuring that was going to be a pretty decent percentage. Um, League of Legends, anyone play League of Legends? No, we got a decent number, decent number. Okay, cool. So, Riot Games primarily uh, is the company behind League of Legends, right? We develop it, publish it, put out new skins for it, run it, the whole nine yards. And one of the things that lets me do for once is actually have cool artwork in my presentations. So sometimes it makes sense and other times I'm just being gratuitous and putting my favorite stuff up here. Um, and my previous presentations have always had like database schemas and JSON and things like that. I'm like, now I get to do this and put these things in here. This is pretty cool. So this is Bilgewater and I've actually, uh, thanks to a hackathon, fished off a pier at the bottom of this uh, using a Vive. So that was kind of cool. Um, so they, we kind of do really sort of interesting things and you could look around and it was a full VR environment. So that's why I put it up there. Um, so Riot Games in Europe specifically, uh, well League of Legends launched in Europe almost at the same time it launched in NA, uh, end of 2009. And at that stage in Europe it was a third party publisher that was just, you know, putting out the game for us in Europe. Weren't a lot of people on the ground. The first Riot office was, a, if I remember correctly, above in, like an Indian restaurant <laughs> somewhere in the middle of Dublin. Um, didn't stay there for long, uh, quickly grew. Um, and fast forward sort of six years and we're now uh, full on, you know, the usual stuff that you'd expect in an Irish company that's, you know, uh, part of a big American company. We've got uh, player support, we have our knock, we have, uh, we have the uh, publishing teams, we have local country teams, we have all these various different functions in there and what we've, but what we've started to expand into as well is actually hiring engineers, taking ownership of our own stuff uh, and the, Europe is basically on the path to being a, an autonomous entity within Riot. That's the, that's the end goal for this. So when I joined there was I think three engineers, now we're up to eight. So that's like almost 300% increase, right? So that's, that's perfect. Uh, but we're, oh dear hiring pretty aggressively and let's see how many times it takes me to type in my password. Because it's really long. Oh. This did not happen in my dry run, I'm just going to say. There we go. Apologies. All right, so that's kind of what Riot's doing in Europe. Um, Riot as a whole, uh, I think, th th was anyone here for uh, Rich Archibald's like core values, right? So, uh, you know, instilling them into a team and we try to do that too and we, we try to do it from the top all the way down, right, and actually come up with core values that make sense as a company. Anyone who's seen, been to a Riot Games uh, presentation before will have seen this. It's in just about every presentation we ever do and it's our sort of core principle for the entire company. It's like it is a mission statement but um, I'm a big old, you know, skeptic and when I get into companies, I've worked for big corporates before and little startups and everything else and generally I take mission statements with a pinch of salt um, but Riot actually does it. It was a big surprise to me. Uh, we actually base all of our decisions on this. Um, that's what it comes down to, it's sort of the root uh, and it's, we aspire to be the most player focused game company in the world. Um, the the way we kind of approach that is these five pillars. 
the work that I'm about to talk about today, uh, you know, fixing the internet for games, um, it kind of falls under three of these categories, but we, we prioritize all of them uh, as much as we can. Um, the three that it kind of applies to most are player experience first. So that, that's a pretty obvious one, right? Making people's gaming experience better is a very obvious way to uh, make the player experience a priority, right? Uh, challenge convention, a little bit less obvious. The, the, the piece where that comes in is uh, don't be afraid to innovate, don't be afraid to say, even though you're a, because this effort started many years ago, uh, don't be afraid to say, even though you're a small company, that it's not the right thing to do to actually go and do this massive piece of work that's going to cost a huge amount of money and take a huge amount of time. If it's the right thing for players, it should seriously be considered as the thing to do, right? Uh, and then the last one is take play seriously. Uh, this is manifesting itself right now uh, in the Dublin office where we have our internal tournament, the, the final of which I am now missing. So I'm a little bit bitter. Um, but the other part that, that this comes into is like a lot of, I'm not sure how many companies out there would care if your ping time is going to go from 50 to 30. It's not going to extract any more money from you. You're not going to buy anything particularly extra, but you're going to have a slightly improved experience and we think that's worth doing because if if you're sitting at home and you're playing the game, you'd really like your ping to be that little bit lower, right? So that's, that's kind of where it comes from. Um, what's, the, what's the problem that we're trying to address? And I'm really happy I have uh, cocktails now. I thought I was just going to have water. This is much better. Um, so what's the problem we're trying to address? Well, the first thing is where does it come from? Why are we doing this? And that's, it's all about consistency and fairness. And why is, why is, that, why is that a problem, right? Well, People invest literally thousands of hours into playing League, League of Legends. I, once, I just interviewed a guy who's, I think he's 21, maybe 22, and uh, we talked about the number of games he's actually played because he's a pretty high, high ELO guy, highly ranked, and uh, he's played three and a half thousand ranked games on one server and 1,500 on another. The average game time is somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 minutes. So you can multiply that out yourself and you get this, some sort of idea of the amount of time he's actually invested in games. And, this, and he is not alone. There are lots and lots of people who have done the same. And what, what would be the most frustrating thing uh, about that is that if, if you're, after putting all that time in and you're about to play that one match that really matters, maybe it's, the, maybe it's a final of a tournament, maybe it's your promotion series to get up to that next bracket that you've been trying to get to for six months, if the underlying technology steps in and takes that away from you. The rage is, is real, believe me. Um, so, and of course, none of your teammates will actually believe you is the other problem, right? I'm like, I swear I had a lag spike. I was going to do what, I, what, I, what I'm supposed to do, but it just didn't work. No one will believe you. Huge rage. Everybody starts, you know, flaming each other and it all, it all goes to hell. Um, and then the consistency part is if you can't rely on the game, the system that you're using, to respond in a reliable way, you can't train yourself, right? And this is epitomized in the pro players. Um, they actually play just like everyone else does in the public servers, uh, where in Europe, anyway, they mostly based out of Berlin, roughly a 40 millisecond ping time. And they play to the level that at a 40 millisecond ping, they know that they can actually buffer abilities. They're that quick. So they know that if your character is moving from here to here, they can just press the key because it's like a 40 millisecond buffer. That's plenty of time for that to just pop when it gets to the end. Whereas when they're playing on a zero, zero millisecond LAN connection, they actually have to change how they play and wait until the character gets there before they can press the button. Things like this, right? So there's people literally micro-optimizing to that level. Uh, and this goes all the way down. And everyone wants to believe they're going to play at that level. That's the other thing. So consistency and fairness is what we want to get to. And what, what's kind of standing in our way? Well, the internet treatment of game traffic, you actually, we had Rich up here just a minute ago and he was talking about how most of the traffic that he sees is TCP based, right? That's actually not the case for game traffic, right? We don't do TCP. Are we working? We are. Okay. So, and I realize this is generalizing massively, by the way, but just you know, stay with me. It's okay. Um, standard web traffic, 1,500 bytes, right? Now we've got other, you've got exceptions. You've got smaller packets, bigger packets, MTUs, uh, jumbo frames, maybe even out there, various other bits and pieces. But let's just say that most of the traffic on the internet is going to nicely fill up an Ethernet frame, right? So, 1,500 bytes, TCP based, represented by Chogoth for anyone who does play League of Legends, because he gets bigger um, as he uh, uh, one of his one of his abilities. Um, and the standard game packet in League of Legends is about 50, 55 bytes. Okay, 
much higher frequency really matters when it gets there, right? And lots of them compared to the uh, the 1500 byte one up there. I re represented with Timo both because he's a little tiny character and because everyone hates him, right? So uh, everyone hates Timo. No, just everyone. Um, and what I mean by that is if you're a network operator and you're operating at huge scale, kind of like what Facebook is doing, imagine if you've got all these people out there who want to send little tiny inefficient packets all the bloody time and they want them to get there just the same way as these. That's not an easy thing to, to do. You're going to have a far higher packets per second ratio here versus those. It's much less efficient. In fact, if you go back to the founding of or the writing of T, uh, TCP uh, as a protocol, right? You had Nagel's algorithm, which specifically looked to address things like this, right? It was built into TCP from the start. Buffer little tiny packets until they become bigger packets before you send them out the socket, right? That's a fundamental thing in TCP that you actually I've run into several times in production and caused all sorts of problems. So, what really matters? Uh, I've picked two. There are other things I will be mentioning them. Obviously, packet loss is another one that comes into this list. But, Latency and jitter, right? So most people know what latency is. They know what ping is. Not so many people know what jitter is. Jitter is basically you can just think of it as the variance that you're going to see in your ping rate, right? Your lag, your latency. How much does it vary? Standard deviation is a good way to look at this, right? So you might have a 30 millisecond ping most of the time, but if it spikes up to 80 milliseconds at the wrong time, you're going to have a bad experience, right? So that's your jitter. Um, there we go. And the interesting thing about latency is that it's actually manageable. Uh, we've had, had people get to almost the top tier in our game with like 100, 120 milliseconds of latency. Now they're the exception, not the rule, that's for sure, but it is possible, right? So the, but there's basically breakpoints. Um, you can acceptably play the game at 80 milliseconds. You can acceptably play the game at 100 milliseconds. It's not quite as responsive, right? And uh, multiple factors play into this, by the way, uh, including like, uh, frame rate on the machine, how often uh, updates actually happen within the code and various other bits and pieces. So what we've actually landed on as a key metric is that 60 milliseconds one, the one at the start, right? Um, that's kind of our bar for a, a good game experience, right? That's, we want everyone to be under 60 milliseconds, right? Which is a non-trivial goal when you're dealing with a massively distributed game, right? Um, just speed of light and number of hops and it gets worse in Europe than it is in the US because you're not just dealing with uh, distance, you're also dealing with borders and the fact that like there aren't just three ISPs that cover X percent of the population, there's just tons of them all over the place. So the other one is jitter and this one's, this one's a very, very big problem, right? Um, because it's much harder, much harder for the end user to spot as well, right? Um, they're like, my ping is always 50 milliseconds and every once in a while, everything just freezes. I like, don't know why. Like, well, what's, or something gets missed and it, it, it's a, that's a really bad experience. Um, and high jitter is essentially unplayable, right? If it's just bouncing around all over the place, you can't train yourself to react to a game where the response time is essentially a random number generator, right? The human brain just can't adapt that quickly. Um, and it always seems to happen at the worst possible time and the reason for that is, the more jitter you have, the more likely it is that that bad spike in lag is going to happen when you least want it to happen, right? It's probably happened six, seven times while you're playing, but you didn't notice because you weren't doing anything important. And then when that key moment comes up, it happens again, that's when you notice, that's when you're pissed off, right? So the real problem here that, we're, that we were trying to address is, well, it's the rest of the internet, actually, as it turns out. So this is a moo-moo. He's, very, he's a sad mummy. Uh, and this is, this, is, this is us being very sad about the fact that the rest of the internet doesn't look like our traffic, basically, right? I told you I was going to throw in artwork all over the place. Um, why is that, right? And where did this Riot Games versus the internet title come from? And this, this is kind of where it did evolve from. Um, most of the internet traffic is made up by our friends at Facebook, <laughs> Netflix, Google, uh, YouTube, which is Google isn't it, as well now. Um, but that's all about bandwidth and throughput. In fact, I actually just had this conversation at lunch uh, that we actually don't care about bandwidth and throughput for the most part. Uh, I mean, everyone knows if you saturate a link, everything else goes to hell as well, right? And um, ISPs, network providers, and I know because I've, I've been on that side of the, the equation, you tend to look at link utilization, you tend to manage your capacity based on how full those links are and you move capacity around based on 
how full those links are going to get. You don't want anything to get sh saturated and you might shift that traffic over there for like six hours at peak and then move it back and things like that, right? And you use the most more expensive uh, peering and transit uh, when you absolutely have to when you're running out of uh, when you're running out of capacity elsewhere because your, your usage spikes at the same time every evening. Like pretty standard trafficking, engineering, uh, on the internet type of stuff, right? And the problem is that if you're optimizing for this, you're not optimizing for the things that we care about, which is a, you know, a nice short uh, round trip time, making sure that that latency stays nice and consistent. You shift that traffic out at peak times, you might introduce eight new hops to our game servers, right? So. There's, there are people out there who know I should not play a ranked game that matters between these four hours because basically my connectivity sucks for those four hours, right? And then once it hits midnight, all the traffic ships back and I can actually play my games again. Like people are optimizing to that level as well. I know from reading the boards and them flaming me when I tried to explain why it's happening. Um, so the, the sort of conclusion here is that the things that we care about as a company uh, and what we're trying to fix for our players are basically incidental in a lot of cases. Like people do care about latency and packet loss, but not to the extent that we do. It's not the fundamental principle that they're actually optimizing for. And hence, Riot Games versus the internet. So what the hell do you do? Right, you're presented with this very big, somewhat insurmountable seeming problem, so what do you actually do? Uh, and this is Heimerdinger, he's the engineering mascot, by the way. Um, he's a really annoying character to play against. Um, so what we did was we founded something called Riot Direct. Uh, and back in the day, Riot Direct was literally like one guy. Uh, but now it's lots of people. And it has some fairly simple goals when it relates to players. The first one is reduce latency. The next one is reduce jitter. Reduce packet loss. And the last one is mitigate DDoS attacks because, well, to be honest, most players can't tell the difference between just, you know, shitty latency and, and uh, jitter and a DDoS attack, right? Anyway, um, I'm not actually going to talk about DDoS here. Uh, there's two reasons for that. One, it's really confidential. And two, it's so confidential they won't tell me. So it's a pretty good reason not to be able to talk about it. In fact, when I sent this, these slides out for review, the first thing I got back was from the, was from the head of security going, are you going to talk about DDoS? And I'm like, no, no, it's okay. Don't worry. Um, but I think any, any network engineer who's out there, when, I, when I've described what we've done, it will be really obvious to you why it's better from a mitigation of DDoS uh, perspective. Um, so the, the other part that I'm not going to cover here, one, because it took too much time, and then two, because it's actually much harder to visualize, is packet loss piece. And one of the things that we've discovered when we've been looking at packet loss is actually that a lot of the packet loss is happening much further towards the customer than we thought, right? So people playing off of their wireless link instead of a wired link, just bad last mile, right? Um, so that's much harder to address. I've kind of left it out here. We do try to optimize for it, um, but latency and jitter, one, much easier to show. Two, we've been much more successful at it, so why would I show stuff that we didn't succeed at? Um, and it's just a, a whole lot easier to, to measure and actually show you the progress that we've made. So. Um, so the, the Riot Direct approach is basically build our own backbone, right? First of all, one of the things they looked at was, are our servers in the right place? Seems like a fairly obvious thing to ask, right? And it might have been a bit late that we were asking it, but um, the, the most obvious place that this was not the case was actually in uh, North America, where all of the game servers, because we're a West Coast company originally, all the game servers were in Oregon. So a very simple analysis showed pretty quickly that that's not the best place to be if you want to serve the whole continent of the, you know, North America, right? Um, so we moved them all to Chicago. Took the whole thing, moved the whole thing to Chicago, right? Um, EU West, which is the largest single shard in the world, by the way, if, I, if anyone's keeping track, um, which is the one that most people here would have played on, um, is, uh, was originally located in Frankfurt, which actually, again, wasn't that optimal. So what should we do? Perhaps we should move it. Where should we move it to, et cetera, right? So that's one of the approaches. Optimizing traffic routing, that's also where we started because that's the sort of thing that you can do by basically annoying ISPs and saying, we have a lot of customers on your network. We really think that you should work with us to improve their experience. They'll be much happier. And most ISPs basically don't listen to you is the, is the story there. Um, but then the other thing is build your own backbone because then, you've actually got some skin in the game. 
then you're actually having a conversation as a peer as opposed to a, basically a supplicate uh, to the networking gods, right? And this is not working. No, it is. Okay. So what does that look like in Europe? Um, this is the current state of the backbone. There's a couple of things that are sort of grayed out a wee bit. Um, I think actually Warsaw is up and live now. Uh, I don't think Bucharest is. But originally, if you're like to rewind back to 2014, it pretty much would have been one or two pubs. Like Frankfurt, um, Amsterdam was probably getting built. Uh, but there really wasn't much else on here. It was all very central and used transit providers and everyone else to just get your traffic in, right? So how do you create a backbone like this? Well, you get on the phone, you start calling, you do a lot of analysis, uh, but you also get on the phone and start calling because you have to try and find out who's actually going to talk to you. You start buying fiber, you start buying hardware or figuring out what the hell hardware you need, hiring network engineers to actually do it. Like we're talking about starting from scratch here. How do you build a, a, a global backbone, right? Um, and then you do it all again, uh, build up an even more of an organization because as it turns out this is a really hard thing to do. Uh, do some more analysis and then realize how expensive it is. Uh, get really scared when you have to go to your boss and tell him how expensive it is. Uh, repeat, rinse, repeat, right? And that's how you build up a backbone of these sites. And that's Dr. Mondo, by the way. That's one of his skins. That was a good one. Um, and eventually you end up with a global backbone like this. And obviously this is a bit simplified. Uh, we've got multiple pops in different places. And, you know, we've got most, of, we've got, I think we've got all the European ones on here and all the NA ones here, but some of the other stuff has been simplified a wee bit. So this is what our sort of global backbone looks like now. And again, if you re rewind two, three years, it was pretty much Oregon, Frankfurt. They didn't even talk to each other directly. It was over a transit provider, right? That kind of thing. And they're all sort of in their own little silos. Now everything's actually connected up. We've even gotten to the point where we, we've, uh, for our Amazon friends in the audience, we've actually gone direct connect and we can carry our uh, inter Amazon VPC traffic across this same backbone and things like that, which is pretty cool. Um, I literally just turned that on like two weeks ago. I'm pretty happy about that. No more VPNs. Um, I literally should have a no more VPN party. So this is a horrible pun and only players will, will get it. Um, but basically the global backbone is sort of like our global ultimate and that has got a huge cringe in the, in the riot office. So there's someone sniggering down the back, I guarantee it. Um, the impact in Europe. So here's the, like, the real cool thing. So we've talked about all the things that we did and all the money we spent and like all the effort we went to over a multi-year uh, period. What have we actually done? Um, Okay, so a quick explanation of this. Uh, the, the way this works is the circles represent the number of players. The size of the circles represent the number of players in each one and each circle is essentially another AS number, right? Um, it's actually, the circles are actually broken out into different places because multi uh, AS numbers are not just all in one place, right? They're actually spread out all over the place. But that's an easy way to interpret it. Green is sub 60 milliseconds. Red is somewhere north of 150. Right, and then everything in between is the gradation between uh, green and red. And this is for EU West, right? So this is this is pre the work that we did, this is before the Amsterdam move, this is before we got that backbone built. Um, that's basically two two and a half years ago. And this is Europe today. So you know, without without really digging into the analysis, this is a very macro level of looking at this, and obviously we drill down a lot. But just looking at that macro level, I think it's pretty obvious that we've done a decent job here, particularly for Southern Europe, right? I mean, the, the red versus green in Spain, right, is very obvious. Uh, weirdly enough, and it's not too easy to spot on this, there's still red right next to Amsterdam, which is literally like 50 miles from where the data center is, so it's possible to be literally right beside the data center and have a poor experience still. So we're still working on it. We're not finished, um, but I think it shows decent progress. i will take a look at this another way. This is the percentage of active accounts with a sub 60 millisecond ping, right? Um, now, because I've been to the statistics talk, uh, note the scale, right? So this, this is not like zero to 100. This is a, you know, seven, eight percent rise over multi, multiple years. Starts back in 2014, comes up to 2016. But I think you can see pretty clearly the trend is in the right direction. Right? And we've definitely improved an awful lot of people, uh, their, their ping time, and getting more and more of them under that 60 millisecond thing. And it, as well as that, like, there's a lot of people coming down from 100 to 80 and 80 to 70 and things like that as well. But like, this is our gold standard. This is where we want everyone to be. If we, if, we, if we could just wave a magic wand and get everyone under this, this is what we do. 
So I think we can see that for EUS, the, the trend is definitely in the right direction. All right. We're we not going next. There we go. This is EUNE, and I think you can. So EU Nordics and East for those who don't automatically convert um, acronyms in their brain uh, magically. Uh, so a lot more red on this. You can see pretty bad down in Turkey. Turkey actually now have their own region. So people in Turkey have a, have an option to play on EUNE if they still wish, or they can play on a, like a Turkish based shard by themselves. Well, not by themselves. Anyone's free to play in Turkey, but you know what I mean. Um, there's a lot of red in Poland. That's a huge player base there, and a lot of people were really pissed off. Um, and there we go. So not as dramatic as the US, but again, I think still shows very decent levels of improvement here. Like so building out our backbone hasn't just been a you know vanity exercise. It's actually literally improved the experience of hundreds of thousands of players across Europe. Right? And that, that ties in directly with our we want to be player focused, we want to get their experience and make it better. Right? To give a couple of concrete solid examples in, in very recently, um, Telefonica in Spain and DTAG. Uh, DTAG is a uh, fairly large ISP I'd say. Let's just say that the percentage of players behind a DTAG AS number is very, very big. They kind of span a lot. And Telefonica is not small either. Um, we peer directly with uh, Deutsche Telekom. I don't think I really need to point out when it was. It's fairly obvious um, where, where that happened. But I mean, the, the, the interesting thing is, right, if you had a good experience on, on Deutsche Telekom, like they're Germans, they over engineer everything, right? So if you're on Deutsche Telekom and you're one of the people, you know, in the lower band, you're probably having a pretty decent experience, right? But it's, again, it's not variance. This is all averages. So you can imagine that the, the, um, the variance that an individual customer might have had would have been huge, like way up, way up there. It could have been unplayable in fact, right? Because again, we're taking averages here. And now we've got it down into a much, much tighter band. You're much more likely to be having that good, solid, sub 60 millisecond experience that we were targeting. A little bit more interesting is the Telefonica one. When do you think we did the peering here? When do you think we actually turned it on? It's actually, if this works, and no, it doesn't. It's actually when it goes up. That's when we turned the peering on. So we actually made it worse. <laughs> Uh, initially, it's not just flick a switch and everything instantly gets better, right? We turned the pairing on with them directly, and it, it just turned out that the, the internal routing then just wasn't optimized, um, and so we had to work with them to get the, the pathing correct and give them some trace routes and everything else. Uh, and then we actually worked, and then it dropped right back down here. So again, that's about a 10 millisecond on average improvement. You know. I don't, you know, I'm not sure how many other companies would make that kind of investment. Like, because we had to go to them, we have to pay them for peering. We're not doing settlement-free peering here. This is actually us paying for a connection in a point of presence, right? Um, the other thing I'll just mention: all of these uh, stats should have mentioned at the start are based on our game servers collecting actual real data from our players. These are not artificial pings. These are not artificial trace routes. These are based on actual game experiences, right? And then because. Uh, I'm being a little bit selfish. <laughs> uh, back there is when we peered with uh, UPC's uh, parent company, Liberty Global. And my ping time is now only about five milliseconds different from the office, which is pretty cool. Um, and actually, I, I have to say, UPC is killing it um, for a number of League of Legends players in Ireland. They're way out ahead. Um, so I think that's self selection there. I think it's pretty obvious what, what's going on. And then because we're in Ireland, one of the things I did was I pulled out a bunch of uh, the individual ISPs, uh, actually their AS numbers, and graphed them out. Um, UBC is actually one of the best. I think BT Ireland beats it on occasion. That's Sky as well for people uh, uh, who are familiar with the market. Um, DigiWeb obviously has some inefficiencies, uh, so we might want to talk to them. And then uh, over the top there is Imagine, and I think the reason why that's up there is basically because they do a lot of WiMAX. So wireless at home is not, even, not great for your, uh, for your gaming experience and it's certainly not fantastic uh, as a general uh, connection method. So the future. Um, one, of the, one of the questions we get is like what are you going to do next, right? Uh, well one, we're going to do more. More peering, um, more interconnect, more optimization of routes, all the things that we've been doing today. We've been kind of like picking off the big chunks. Uh, now we're starting to do more in-depth analysis. Um, 
And what we're doing here in Europe, we actually have two Riot Direct employees in Europe right now, one network engineer and uh, one analyst, and he, is, he literally combs through this stuff. He's the one who identified the problems in Poland, that's why we now have a pop there. Uh, a mini pop, it's not a full-fledged full thing, but it's still there to service the, uh, the Polish ISPs and make sure that we actually give people a good experience there. So we're going to be doing more of that, more detailed, uh, more European-focused, uh, because we now sort of starting to bring it in and own it here, and we're going to hire a lead an infrastructure lead to really take this over and drive it forward. Um, and then more tuning, more peering, increase the global backbone footprint, etc. Right? So that's easy. That's what you're already doing. Or we, we, we talked about like innovating, not challenging convention, actually doing interesting stuff. What are we going to do about that? Um, Facebook's switches are, make us a little bit envious, uh, you know, building your own and doing all that and actually having the thing that you can rely on because you built it or distrust because you built it. Um, Software-defined networking, uh, like our first step towards some of this is actually uh, vendor neutral configuration, right? So we, we abstract a layer above all of the proprietary stuff we're using and just use a single layer to configure everything. So it doesn't matter if we swap in a Juniper for a Cisco or whatever. You just configure it all the same way. That was the first step. And the next step is let's do it all as code. Let's do it all as software. Let's take advantage of some of those new cool technologies coming out there and actually really get control of our backbone, of our network. So that's one of the things we're looking at. Um, we're looking for better equipment, better data insights. We're always looking for better ways to actually cut, slice, understand real player pain, right? So we've started with let's get everyone under 60 milliseconds. Packet loss hasn't really followed, right? We fixed a bunch of stuff, but packet loss is still there. And it's just as problematic for gamers, right? So how do we tackle that? Sometimes when we turn on appearing, packet loss does get better. But a lot of the time it doesn't. It just stays exactly where it was. And what that sort of implies to us is that the packet loss wasn't between their AS and our AS. The packet loss is somewhere in their AS or in ours maybe, right? But uh, they all have different baselines, so we need to tease that stuff out. Um, and then we're going to have more games in the future. Right Games has a plural at the end, the S, right? Game two is coming real soon now, I swear. Um, and we want to make sure that we don't repeat the same mistakes that we've done before, right? We want to use this platform. We want to use all the lessons that we've learned to do it again. And then maybe we even open this up to other people and let you use it. That's actually being discussed internally, right? We've built a low latency, latency focused, uh, low jitter network. If you're a startup gaming company, you can't just invest that kind of money, right? So we're looking to see if there's people who, if that's a viable thing to do. And that's it. That's my talk. Um, I'll leave that up there with a subtle message. Uh, that's the. That's the PC bong, if people don't read Korean. Uh, we have that in the Dublin office. It's, it's, a, it's an homage to the uh, PC cafes in Korea where, where League of Legends is basically a national sport. Uh, and you are, that's our security team working hard on the security right there, <laughs> as you can see. Uh, but no, you're actually required and encouraged to play the game. And not just our game, any game you want. Uh, and that's one of the places you can get to do it. So you're wel welcome to come in for a tour, by the way. You don't actually have to work there to see, see the cool stuff. So hit me up afterwards. And I'm way into the break, I think, at this point, right? Yeah. So if people need to go get coffee, by all means, or feel free to ask questions. We need to join the rooms, so. All right. Yeah. For, uh, we have to join the rooms, so I'm getting the hell out of here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. And apologies for hurrying you along. That's all right. Don't worry about it. So we're back in here.